Earlier this year, I had a pretty awful experience which changed the way in which I see the world forever. I was publicly mocked, attacked, shamed, and humiliated on social media. Why? Partly for daring to suggest that it's okay for scientists to cry. Before I explain further, let me tell you a little bit about myself. My name's Dr. Emily Grossman, and I absolutely love science. I've always loved solving problems, figuring stuff out, understanding the world. When I was a kid, my favorite word was why. I would drive my teachers and my parents mad. I also love communicating, talking to people, explaining stuff, helping people to understand stuff, and performing on stage. When I was growing up, I wanted to be a scientist, or an actress, or both, but I had no idea how to combine these different parts of myself. So I studied natural science at Cambridge, went on to do a PhD in cancer research, then I swapped things around for a bit and trained and worked as a professional actress and singer, and now I finally found a way to combine my passions as a science broadcaster and educator. I teach science, I explain science on the TV and radio, I give talks on science in schools and at universities. I aim to show people just how exciting science is and to inspire more young people to study it. And I love what I do. And so it was that earlier this year, I was invited to take part in a debate on the national news channel on sexism and women in science. Now, this was something I'd done several times before, but this time the outcome was a little different. One of the things we were discussing was whether it's okay for female scientists to cry. Now, as someone who is sensitive and at times emotional and proud of it, my response was a no-brainer. Some women cry. So what? I cry. We should be encouraging more men to cry. And any implication that women who cry are in some way less competent as scientists is irresponsible, especially in an environment where we're already so many girls lack the confidence to pursue careers in science. We urgently need to encourage more girls to study science, not risk putting them off. In response to my interview, I received a torrent of abuse on social media. You know how they say, never read the comments? Well, I read every single one. And there were thousands of them. <laughs> Many of them undermining me, my credentials, women in general. They seemed basically designed to shut me up. What I found most upsetting were not the ones personally attacking me, but the ones attacking me as a representative of all women, saying that women are biologically inferior to men, aren't clever enough to be scientists, are illogical, incapable of rational thinking, and should get back in the kitchen. Ones calling women like me crybabies or emotionally incontinent toddlers. But what I found most disturbing was the idea that there's no room for feelings in science. Comments such as, women are too sensitive for science. These so-called touchy-feely strengths of women are of no importance in science. And there is no crying in science. Can't stand the heat, stay out the kitchen. For me, it was this notion that people who show emotion are not welcome in the lab that was so troubling. There is this outdated stereotype that all scientists are cold, hard, logical, unemotional, and male. Not only is it wrong, it's immensely damaging. It's exactly this that is putting off some of the people that science so desperately needs to attract, women. The proportion of women in STEM careers, that's science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, is only 14% in the UK, lower than any other European country, with women making up only 17% of science professors. In nearly half of all mixed state sixth forms, there's not a single girl studying physics. This lack of women in STEM is causing a major skills shortage in England, with one in four core STEM vacancies being hard to fill. And the Royal Society of Biology estimates that increasing women's representation in STEM could boost our economy by more than two billion pounds. So why aren't women studying science? A huge body of evidence shows that it's not that we're any less able or any less interested. In fact, girls routinely outperform boys. So then what is it? It's that they simply see it as not for people like me. Now, I was lucky. I grew up in a supportive environment where it wasn't anything out of the ordinary for a girl to want to be a physicist. But many girls aren't so lucky. 
If you ask someone to draw a scientist, most people will draw an old white man in a white coat with crazy hair, right? And this stereotype is perpetuated on TV, in movies, in history books, sometimes even by parents and teachers. So it's really hard for some girls to actually see themselves as scientists, and many lack the confidence to pursue it. In fact, a recent survey showed that nearly two-thirds of 11 to 21-year-old girls still think that science and maths is for boys. Add to this the fact that, whether through innate differences or social conditioning, Many girls, and of course some boys too, think that they, they see that they have qualities that they perceive are not welcome in science. Many girls I teach tell me they, they worry that they're too sensitive, too emotional, or too creative to be scientists, even though they're good at science and they enjoy it. How can we expect to solve the world's problems if we're potentially putting off half of the talent? The truth is, is that science needs many different types of people with many different qualities. Of course, scientists need to be logical and analytical with an ability to think rationally and solve problems. But there is so much more to being a scientist than that. An ability to connect with our feelings, to be emotionally open, whether as a man or a woman, is as important in science as it is in life. So, what's the benefits of feelings in science, both personally and professionally? We live in a society in which an outward expression of our emotions, particularly as tears, has been stigmatised. When reporting from the aftermath of the horrific attacks in Paris recently, a male TV reporter broke down live on air and then felt the need to apologise. Men have been conditioned to stuff down their emotions, to repress what they're really feeling. Surely this can't be healthy. No wonder in the UK, suicide is the biggest killer of men under the age of 45. And in a male world such as science, many women feel they have to do the same. But crying is an important part of what makes us human. I think that an ability to cry when we feel things is a gift. For a start, it's it can stop us from bottling up our emotions, allowing them to pass freely through us rather than turning them inwards as stress, anxiety, or depression. Crying is one of the body's natural ways of expressing and releasing emotion and processing our experiences. One study has shown that nine out of 10 people feel better after a good cry. I know I do. <laughs> but as well as making us feel better, crying can actually be an expression of how much we care. When I was a research scientist, sometimes I would cry when my experiments went wrong because I really cared about my work. For me, it was a sign that I wanted to improve and grow. And there are plenty of other successful scientists, both male and female, who've shared stories of how they've cried over their experiments too. And crying can be a show of joy as well. When the astronaut Alan Shepard first set foot on the moon, he was so overwhelmed that he cried for several long minutes. Crying is an essential part of our humanity. OK, so that all makes sense on a personal level. But could an ability to connect with our feelings, to, to be emotionally open, both as men and women, make us not just more fully rounded human beings, but better scientists too? Yes, I believe it can. Because just as important in scientific discovery as logic and analysis, are three C's, compassion, collaboration, and creativity. And I believe that an emotional openness is essential for all three. First C, compassion. When we're connected to our feelings, we're also open to the feelings of others in the world around us, able to care deeply about the suffering of others and our planet. Now, scientists seek to understand the world, yes, but many scientists also seek to help it, to cure diseases, to save the planet from climate change, to invent life-saving medical equipment. A professor of ocean, ocean geology was being interviewed on Radio 4 about the effects of carbon dioxide emissions on the sea. As she shared her fear that her young daughters would grow up into a world where they couldn't enjoy shellfish and coral reefs by the end of the century, she started to cry. 
Without compassion, many scientists would not be moved to do the work they need to do to change the world. Second C, collaboration. When we're connected to all parts of ourselves in a state of emotional openness, we're emotionally open to others too. Able to listen, to empathize, to see things from a different perspective, to work together. Re research from MIT has shown that the most successful teams are the ones that show the highest degree of social sensitivity or empathy to each other. Collaboration is an essential part of the scientific process. When Watson and Crick were trying to figure out the structure of DNA, they worked together, They're bouncing ideas off each other, building models, as well as using the X-ray crystallography data from Rosalind Franklin. At the Large Hadron Collider, there are hundreds of scientists working together to record and make sense of and analyze the data. And at Imperial College London, scientists studying, studying infectious diseases work alongside uh, medics, uh, pharmacists, engineers, social scientists, behavioral scientists, geographers, even economists, in tackling antibiotic resistance, one of the major challenges facing the world today. And in our digital age, with an increasing amount of scientific data readily available, as well as the ability to sequence a genome at the drop of a hat, the ability to work together is more important than ever. And for these teams, science needs people with all sorts of different perspectives from different backgrounds and disciplines, bringing emotional and intellectual qualities to bring new ideas and insights. A McKinsey report has shown that gender diverse teams are 15% more successful. Third C, creativity. When we're emotionally open, we can relax, think freely and laterally, look at problems from new directions, connect with our imagination and our intuition. In other words, be creative. Studies have shown that in order to be creative, our brain needs to oscillate freely between states of relaxation and focus, and that feeling anxious, uneasy, tense, or fearful, commonly associated with being emotionally blocked, are also linked to decreased creativity. Many of the greatest scientific discoveries have come about through a combination of logic and analysis with creativity and imagination. And many of the greatest minds in scientific history have been deeply connected with their feeling, intuitive nature. The mathematician Poincaré said, it is by intuition we discover and by logic we prove. In 1865, the German chemist Kekulé was sitting in his chair by the fire, trying to figure out the bonding in benzene, a natural chemical in crude oil. He nodded off to sleep and had a dream of a serpent eating its tail. He woke up with the realization that the electrons in the molecule form a ring. He later said to his colleagues, gentlemen, let us learn to dream. When Einstein was trying to figure out his special theory of relativity, he hit on E equals MC squared, his groundbreaking equation, and then tried to find the mathematical proof. He said, imagination is more important than knowledge. Sometimes I feel I am right, I do not know I am. In fact, a study has shown that Nobel Prize winning scientists are more than three times more likely than normal scientists to have creative hobbies. And research from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute has shown that when scientists are given creative freedom, they publish twice as frequently in the top scientific journals, but also twice as frequently in the bottom ones. <laughs> but that's okay, because to be truly creative, we have to be prepared to fail, to take risks, to follow our curiosity, go down unexpected paths. But in our society, we live in a society based on fear of failure. Many of us are afraid to take risks, to, to step outside our current way of thinking. But in science, this is essential. So many important discoveries have come about through mistakes, chance observation, things that have gone wrong. As Isaac Asimov said, the most exciting phrase in science is not Eureka, but that's funny. <laughs> when Fleming left his Petri dish by the open window and it got contaminated with fungus, he happened to notice that some of the bacteria had died too, and he decided to investigate further. If he'd simply chucked it away, he would never have discovered antibiotics. There are so many huge, important things still to be solved in the world. And to solve these problems, we need to find new creative ways of looking at them. 
and we need to create environments that nurture creativity and support diversity and emotional openness. Dr. Shelley Moran, Royal Society Research Fellow and Senior Lecturer in Physics at Imperial College London, has ripped apart her office and filled it with space hoppers. She sometimes delivers her lectures in an animal costume. <laughs> she says it makes the students laugh and helps them to look at things differently. We need to dispel this image of scientists as cold and unemotional. And we need to attract more people into science who can bring, yes, logic and analysis, both male and female, but also emotional openness. Because from emotional openness comes greater access to the three Cs, compassion, collaboration, and creativity. And it's only by combining all of these elements that we're going to be able to move forwards together. Einstein once said, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the rational mind is a faithful servant. We have created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. I cried after the trolling following my TV interview. I cried a lot. I cried because I witnessed so much fear and anger and hatred. And for a while, the world seemed a pretty desolate place. But crying is okay. In fact, crying is essential. And after I'd cried, I came back, bigger and stronger, clearer, able to understand and make sense of what had happened to me. And I'm glad it happened, because it helped me to see what's important to me, what it is I want to say and put out into the world, which is to remind you that some of the greatest minds in scientific history, in fact, some of the greatest people in history, have been deeply connected to their emotions. So, parents, tell your children. Teachers, encourage your students. Students, support each other to feel, no matter what gender you identify with, and to feel excited about science. And let's create a new generation of scientists who are not put off by gender, race, background, or anything else, but who are united only in a desire to want to understand the world. Because if you're excited about understanding the world, then science is for you. And science needs you. Not just even if you cry, but especially if you cry. Thank you.